Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Back to Basics, Fundamental Concepts and Special Considerations in RNA Isolation, presented by Mr. Abhishek Sharma, a Senior Global Market Manager at Kyogen. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Kyogen. Kyogen serves more than 500,000 customers around the globe, all seeking insights from the building blocks of life, DNA, RNA, and proteins. They deliver samples to insight solutions for molecular testing, propelling Kyogen customers from start to finish to unlock new insights. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located at the lower left of your presentation window and type your questions into the box that appear on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you'll be viewing this presentation in a slide window. To enlarge that window, just click on the screen icon located at the lower right. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or use the Q&A button and let us know you're having a problem. Good news, the presentation is educational and thus offers continuing educational credits. Click on that button in the bottom left-hand corner and follow the process for obtaining your credits. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Abhishek Sharma. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you, and um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about the uh, sometimes uh, not so taken seriously facts of RNA isolation. So hello, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Abhishek Sharma, and as I, it was already introduced that I'm the Senior Global Market Manager for Sample Technologies at Kyogen. Uh, I'm, I've been uh, working here for more than five years and responsible to to do uh, watch the the RNA related technologies very closely in this domain. So I would be very happy to to share some of my experience in the lab before when I was a biochemist and today when I'm I'm working with Kyogen. Uh, so before uh, I move forward and share with you the agenda, I would like to make sure that uh, you to manage your expectations that today's webinar. Uh, as the name suggests, we want to go back to the basics of RNA isolation. Uh, why? Because I think that's the step one in any of your uh, research applications that you want to do downstream. And sometimes uh, we miss out on some of the small considerations that are needed to get that high yield as well as the RNA integrity. Uh, just a legal disclaimer that whatever products that I would be talking here today and the techniques I'll be talking about are only intended for molecular biology applications and they have no claims or no intention for diagnosis or prevention of treatment of disease purpose. Uh, if you want to see all the updated licensing related to our products, you can go uh, on kaijin.com and download the handbooks and use the manuals or you can always uh, reach out to your technical services or your local distributor in your country. So as I said, this is the agenda for today's talk. Um, I'll just touch a little bit. Let's uh, brush up our knowledge about the what I call the RNA universe inside the cell. Uh, then I give certain general remarks related to handling the RNA in general, whether it's pre-isolation, during the isolation, or post-isolation. We talk about the stabilization of RNA in samples before actual process, then the special considerations for different sample types in RNA isolation. Uh, I would touch a little bit about microRNA and exosomal RNA purification, and then at the end I would like to share some of the Kyogen solutions for quality RNA. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, this is the view of uh, which is from our RNA Universe app. So, uh, and why we call it RNA Universe because you can there are it's a, it's a nice overview to show you that there are so many types of RNAs. And uh, when we started looking at RNAs, uh, uh, formerly the focus of RNA was always on the longer than 200 nucleotide, which we call also uh, as the mRNA or ribosomal iron iron uh, RNA. Uh, ironically. Um, 
we we used to call them the total RNA, but but when the studies expanded, we started seeing the roles of other type of smaller RNAs, uh, for ex uh, which we call as the small non-coding micro RNAs, or now in fact the long non-coding RNAs. Uh, uh, these are functional RNAs molecules we know that do not translate into proteins, but they are often involved in the regulation of the gene expression and, and very important when you're doing, studying a pathway or, or a, how a disease area works. Uh, with time, people have also started exploring more further than that, and we call the new stream the exosomal RNAs and uh, the RNAs which are pre present in the extracellular vesicles. Uh, I would not go into much details there because that's in itself is a very big topic and so I'll keep it very basic as I said. If you want to get the complete picture, you can always download this RNA Universe app by going on the uh, kaijin.com and to the app section. It's very interactive. You can you can plug and play and then, and, and look at the different RNAs. Um, and, and by the way, on the left side, I mentioned, like, did you know that people who do RNA research, uh, there have been more than 30 scientists who have received a Nobel Prize for research in RNA. So I think that's, that's, that's really a proud thing. Uh, now, how the RNA is distributed in, in, a, in a typical cell? Uh, a typical growing mammalian cell culture can contain from 10 to 30 picogram total RNA per cell. Whereas uh, a fully differentiated primary cell will contain far less, like uh, in the region of less than one picogram per cell. Uh, the majority of RNA molecules are tRNAs or rRNAs. Uh, messenger RNA, which people are mostly interested in, only accounts for one to five percent. Uh, even when you look further into the messenger RNA, it it comprises of uh, three percent pool and. Uh, if you if you look at the classification based on its abundance, which is which is shown at the the lowest uh, table, uh, it can even be less than 0.01 percent. That's rare and and low abundance messages. Uh, so which can even just, just translate into a copy number of only five to 15 molecules per cell. Uh, so so what it says is that it's it's really important that how you handle your RNA while your isolation process because it's it's definitely uh, it's 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 not that much that you can afford to lose any amount of RNA. Here I I just wanted to share with you that how uh, a typical or a generic gene expression workflow looks like uh, no matter what you do uh, downstream whether you're using NGS whether you're using uh, the the qPCR PCR techniques but that's how a generic uh, process looks like so it starts with sample collection which can happen in the field or in the lab or in some other lab where you get your samples from then you do the disruption to get open it up the cells or the tissues then you do the actual purification, get your nucleic acid out, then you do the cDNA synthesis and analysis with, a, with, with depending on what, what technique are you using and further you do a data interpretation and, uh, <clears throat> and analysis and, uh, of your experiment. Uh, I would only focus on the first three parts because we're going to talk about the isolation only, but I think sample collection and disruption is an integral part of that. So some general remarks on, on handling the RNA. Uh, you should always wear latex or vinyl gloves to prevent any RNAs contamination. Uh, and uh, as we know that uh, RNA is, uh, is very stable and it does not require any cofactors and are effective in very small quantities also. So we need to make sure that we minimize the RNAs contamination as much as possible. Uh, this can come from any source, it could be your human skin, it could be dust particles which can carry bacteria or molds. Uh, and we know that RNA is relatively unstable as compared to the, to the DNA uh, and it can break down very quickly with the, with the RNA. So make sure that you wear the gloves uh, which prevent the contamination. You should keep changing your gloves very frequently. Uh, you should sterile with the recommended processes if you're using a plastic wear. Uh, if you're using a non-disposable plastic wear, 
make sure that you treat it well with the RNA uh, the, um, so that it's RNA free. You have to rinse it with NaOH or EDTA followed by RNA free water. Alternatively, you can always use uh, chloroform resistant plastic wares um, that can be rinsed with chloroform, but make sure that you, know, you use, you, you know that you're using a chloroform resistant plastic ware. So, <clears throat> of course, all these things can be done, but at the same time, working quickly with your samples and with your, with your RNA carefully is the key for, for a good success during the experiment. Further, I'm trying to talk here about also what can you do if you're using a glassware. Uh, you should clean them with detergent. You should rinse them oven baked at 240 degrees for at least four hours before use uh, because autoclaving alone will not fully inactivate the RNA. So alternative treatments could be with the EPC treatment. Uh, if you, when, when you're doing the analysis afterwards, if you're running the electrophoresis, the tanks should be cleaned with detergent. They should be thoroughly rinsed with RNA-free water and then with ethanol and then allow them to dry up. Uh, if you're using plastic in the, in the electrophoric tanks, uh, <coughs> so uh, they're not resistant to, to ethanol, so you should be careful about that fact also. Uh, if you want to look at the complete tips, they're, they're also, as I said, available in the resources on the section. There is this uh, link provided here, but we, you can always ask uh, for the link later on. Now, I would like to move to the next step uh, during the process, which we call as the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, stabilization of the RNA in the samples. Uh, why it is important, like, uh, and it might be possible that you might not be harvesting the samples by yourself. Uh, it might be happening somewhere else. But if you're doing that by yourself, uh, we have, uh, I think it's important to know that once you harvest a sample, there could be two type of artifacts that can, can happen uh, depending on how you are handling your sample. There could be down regulation, which is uh, basically uh, the genes and the the genes get down-regulated and the enzymatic degradation of RNA, which results in artificial reduction of both of non-specific or specific messenger RNA. So basically, whatever the messenger RNA level was in vivo is down-regulated and it's not showing the same um, during the, uh, the later on when you're doing the isolation. So at the same time, it can happen that with stress or environmental conditions uh, or processing of the sample, certain genes can be induced. And this will increase in the level of messenger RNAs. Uh, so therefore, the combination of these two effects can have, can have va variant results on your, the transcription profile, which would be probably completely different from the true in vivo gene expression patterns. And you might wonder that why uh, certain uh, data is not coming correctly. So uh, you, need to, you need to consider this, that the sample collection and stabilization is, is very important. Uh, normally, to stabilize the samples, uh, traditionally, uh, people harvest the, sam uh, the, the, the samples and immediately froze them in liquid nitrogen and store at minus 80 degrees until it is processed. It's, it's gen and generally, it works, but at the same time, uh, <clears throat> there are many stabilization reagents which are available from uh, uh, commercial suppliers like Kyogen, which can be alternatively used to stabilize RNA, and you can actually stabilize the RNA to be used for many, many, uh, much, much longer time. Uh, well, in, the, in this particular slide, what this is what I just spoke about. We're just trying to visualize that, that when a rat kidney was either immediately stabilized in using a RNA later reagent or when it was left unstabilized. So what we did, we, <clears throat> after every five minutes gap, uh, RNA was purified with the stabilized sample using a RNA easy kit and, the un and from the unstabilized samples using a standard procedure. Then what we did, the purified RNA was analyzed on agarose gel and the gap DH expression was examined by northern blot. So you can clearly see that just after five, 10 minutes, uh, 
that you start having a smear. So that shows that the RNA start degrading very fast within like 10 minutes. And But on the other side, the stabilized RNA was intact and you could get clear bands uh, even uh, at after 60 minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me. As I mentioned that uh, normally the goal of stabilization is to stop induction of any RNA transcription, it prevents any down regulation, it prevents any unspecific degradation of RNA. So uh, I think it's important to see that what are the various type of uh, uh, stabilization agents available. Uh, there are agents which bind directly to the nucleic acids, there are agents that lyse these cells, there are agents that inhibit denature or, or to the precipitation of the nucleases. Uh, Kaijin also uh, has variety of, uh, of stabilization reagents depending on different sample types, which is shown here uh, in, the, uh, in the table below. So you have different sample types, then you have different sample stabilization, and at the same time, the, uh, if you want to do a simultaneous sample stabilization and purification, so there are different kits available for that. Well, now moving to the next step, which is disruption. So uh, I would say the effective disruption and homogenization for any sample is, is absolute requirement for all RNA um, isolation purification procedures. Uh, normally, uh, there are two, two steps involved in that, in that disruption and homogenization. So first part, which is about completely disrupting the, the structure of the cell, tissue, walls, and then basically the purpose is to release all the RNA content in the sample in the environment. And uh, they, there are different methods to do depending on your samples, and incomplete disruption can have significantly, it can really reduce your, your yields. Uh, then what you do, you do a homogenization which is necessary because you want to reduce the viscosity, uh, which happens because when you, when you disrupt, there are different type of genomic DNA or proteins or other um, biomolecules available, so you would like to reduce that uh, viscosity. Uh, and if you don't do it properly, then you can have inefficient binding of RNA, and therefore later you can really also reduce the, the yields like that. So, <clears throat> Uh, classical method, which I think everyone knows, is the using the mortar and and pestle. You just use a liquid nitrogen to freeze your sample. Then you make a powder. This approach works well, but it's still incomplete. Then you use the powdered sample. You resuspend it into a, a, a cryotropic lysis buffer to do the further lysis, and then. Um, you share the, the genomic DNA with the needle and syringe, which improves the efficiency, and it also helps in removing the genomic DNA. But it, 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 it's not always 100% uh, reproducible, the same results. It doesn't work always because gDNA can always add viscosity, and you can have clogging of your filters. You can have like a bit, let's say, even a, a failed isolation procedure. <clears throat> uh, this is just to show uh, a very fast and simple homogenization kit for cell lysate. We call it the Kaya Shredder. <clears throat> it's a good option for a convenient homogenization if it offers very fast and simple method. Here, and here also you can see the comparison of method and their, uh, their effectiveness. So again, the same uh, uh, gap DH uh, plot with northern blotting when you, were have, when you did not use homogenization when you just use vortexing, and when you use Kaya Shredder or any electric homogenizer. So it, it gives, if you're using a cell lysate, it gives pretty good results that you don't even need to go for an electric uh, um, homogenizer. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, with time, uh, there have been many mechanical tools on the market developed to help you out with disruption and homogenization steps. Uh, these tools accomplish both disruption and homogenization simultaneously. Uh, it does require bead mills. It could be stainless steel or glass beads, depending on the, the tissue or the sample type. Uh, Kaijin provides 
series of such methods uh, depending on your throughput. So if you just want to run as simple as a one sample per run, uh, you should use a tissue rupture. If you want to go up to 12 samples per run, the tissue low, we call it the tissueizer low throughput, and it has a bigger range. It can work with yeast, bacteria, humans, plants. And if you really are doing high throughput or mid throughput activities, then tissueizer 2 would be your best deal, I have to say. And it's, it, these are very benchtop compact instruments, but, but really provide a good, uh, efficient, simultaneous disruption and homogenization of your samples. I think that's a good example to show that how effective tissue disruption is uh, when, uh, so in this, and the, what are the benefits of using a mechanical method. <clears throat> so what, what was done here was that uh, the various rat tissues, whether it was skin, heart, lung, brain, they were disrupted either using tissueizer low throughput or tissueizer two, and then the RNA was purified using a, a Kaya cube and then uh, we used a spectrophotometer to, to look at the yields of the RNA. What you can clearly see is that the data illustrates that there's a consistency that you can achieve with these mechanical methods and that's important for your reproducibility of your results, which is I think a very big concern always. Okay, so that was about the disruption. Now I'll switch the gears a bit to the next step. So once you have done the disruption, homogenization, um, a good life uh, uh, solution is ready, then uh, let's talk about some tips and tricks uh, in, uh, in isolating RNA from different type of samples. Of course, we would not go into details of every sample type, but you can always send us questions or ask the questions uh, if you have any specific uh, question for your protocol. Uh, but yeah, as first, let's let's have a quick uh, uh, look at the two. I would say the two main techniques or technologies available uh, uh, to do the isolation. That's precipitation versus the spin columns. So precipitation is all of us know. It's we all have used uh, in home as homebrew methods with phenol chloroform uh, precipitation. Uh, iso uh, Isolation, it's cheap, no kit is required, it's very scalable uh, as, as compared to spin column that it has a higher material cost. But, but then I think we should look at some of the other pros and cons of both the techniques that in the beginning it might look that spin columns are costlier, but then precipitation has longer handling time, incubation times, you need several rounds to even get a decent purity. There's always a risk of losing your RNA pellet it's just so much dependent on pipetting skills and especially like if you have small samples you cannot afford to lose any any of your pellets there uh, on the other side spin column is fast it's easy to use you get high form of purity as well as the integrity is maintained it is coming in different types and sizes for even very small samples so the reproducibility of your of your results like has much higher chance here and yeah So now moving on, as I mentioned, like this is just to show you uh, how do you deal with the uh, isolating RNA, when, which I call the uh, difficult to lyse tissues like hurt muscles and other fibrous tissues. There's always a challenge with the contractile proteins, tissues, collagen, which can interfere with your isolation process. So you really need to make sure that you treat it with a protein protein K or RNAs free protein K and protease and phenol containing lysis reagents because that's an important step to make uh, uh, to maintain the, you know your proper conditions and that do not degrade of your RNA and uh, then after that I think uh, you should make sure that you use a <clears throat> a good we call in in, in chiogenous the RNA easy tissue kits but you should use a, a good Kit to to make sure to get that uh, a good yield at the end from these uh, difficult to lyse tissues. Um, in this example, it's just showing you that how uh, uh, RT-PCR was performed with a total RNA, which was uh, which was isolated with help of RNA easy fibrous tissues, and then you can see that consistency in the in the in the graph and in the in the in the signal that was received. 
RNA from FFP. I think FFP is one uh, a challenging sample in itself. Uh, we all, uh, mostly people who are working with uh, with FFP know that there are two reasons. Uh, first is that RNA gets physically fragmented, when, which is mainly the function of how uh, the long blocks or sections have been stored, usually at room temperature, I think. Uh, uh, second, there are f the formaldehyde reacts with the amino groups of nucleic acid or proteins resulting in these covalent chemical modifications and cross-linkage happens. Uh, so uh, there are FFP kits which uses protein kinase to digest away the proteins, which allows like the, the RNA or DNA gets solubilized. But what it does not do, it, it does not break up the cross-linking. So we have uh, made these uh, special, more advanced FFP kits. Uh, that includes a specialized buffer which is effective enough to do that reversing of the cross-linking, uh, which is, I think, important um, to make sure that you, you get uh, all the yield back uh, when you're working with the FFP samples. Uh, <clears throat> as I say, that all of these are a, a topic in itself, so if you want to do more details about a complete guide of FFP, then you should look check out uh, this this brochure. It's called Critical Factors for Molecular Analysis of FFP Samples. This is an example to show you that how uh, we did a successful detection of microRNA and mRNA uh, from the same elute using a microRNA Z FFP uh, kit. And it shows that how a purified RNA was, uh, was uh, at even at was formally infixed for 24 hours and 60 hours, and then still you can see the um, that the CT value. You can see the the yields were were very high. <clears throat> if you're working with human blood samples, uh, there could be many challenges. Right from small amount of RNA, the RNA integrity could be issue due to the presence of RNAs in the blood. Uh, there are different type of, there is cellular RNA, there is exosomal RNA, free circulating RNA, in, and contaminations, we have, you have to make sure that all the contaminations are, are properly removed, uh, such as anticoagulants used in stabilization sample. Um, uh, so um, if you, um, uh, so you have to make sure that uh, the, uh, the contamination, these, I think that's the take home message for me from this, this uh, the slide that uh, make sure that you uh, the you remove these anticoagulants right in time from from during your your isolation process. There are there are these special uh, uh, special range of products which uh, which Kaijen also provides uh, in combination with another company. It's called Paxgene. I think that's an that's very efficient and effectful right from the collection tubes to isolation. So please do check out if you want to know more details about that on the Paxgene uh, website. Then uh, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people who work with the plant material and I and isolate regularly the, the nucleic acids there and they know the, the pain there because initially it looks like that uh, uh, the sample abundance is not the problem, but then you have other problems like plant metabolites are difficult to remove. Uh, uh, so what we recommend is use as healthy young tissues uh, recommended from our side because they have fewer metabolites than the same amount of the older tissues. Uh, there are many homemade protocols uh, which are recommended. For example, you should be growing plants in darkness for one or two days. Uh, before you do the harvesting to prevent any high level of plant metabolites. Uh, and of course, you should, there are also um, commercial solutions available, like there are dedicated kits which can solve uh, all your worries at one go. And Kaijin has specially designed uh, this problem of overcoming the metabolite challenges with the help of the Kaijin RNA Z plant kits. And think on the next slide. Yes, I would like to show you that uh, how you can get reproducible purification of and the intact RNA from different type of tissues by using just this one, one kit. I mean, here you can see there are five different plant species and uh, the RNA Easy Plant Mini was used 
to purify the RNA and then the, the results were run on the agarose gel and you can see the sharp intense uh, ribosomal RNA bands uh, which, which indicates the reproducibility of the intact RNA. <coughs> Then just few thoughts on isolating RNA from bacteria and virus. Again, it can be challenging because uh, bacteria mRNA has no 5 dash cap and it only rarely has any poly A tails. So uh, the hybrid capture is almost impossible for, for ma messenger RNA. Uh, there we have a specific uh, specialized kit for that which is called RNA Z Protect Bacteria Kit. I think that's that's the that's a good solution as compared to any homebrew method that you can use for um, to when if you're working with bacteria and um, also the uh, same goes for the for the viral uh, viral RNA uh, when you're purifying it then the major challenge comes is that it's it's so small and, and so concentrated as compared to the, um, and there is a large and large sample volume of the whole store uh, or the, the sample that you use. Uh, so when you're dealing with such huge volumes, I think uh, uh, the range of Kiamp viral kits, which can help you to get uh, uh, starting volumes of, of as high as 5 ml would be, would be definitely helpful. Uh, and in this example, what we're trying to, to show is the amplification of RNA from plasma. Uh, the RNA in this case was extracted using a Kiamp viral RNA kit, and the products of uh, 1,026 nucleotide RNA fragments were spiked in, and you are then able to see that, uh, that RNA was extracted even when present in low copy number. So I think copy number somewhere around uh, plus 100 something. So. Then uh, the next step, which uh, I think I wanted to spend some time with you, was uh, about removal of the genomic DNA. So, so why genomic DNA removal in itself uh, is very important. That uh, if you if you're left with traces of amounts of gDNA, and then you do sensitive applications, uh, for example, uh, if you run real time RT PCR, both RNA and DNA targets will get amplified, and you might get unreliable quantification and results which you were not intended in the beginning. They can interfere with the primer designs. They can, <clears throat> so I think it's important that you should already start thinking of it to make sure that the genomic DNA is completely eliminate, eliminated even during the RNA purification process. And you can always check back and, and do it again during the cDNA synthesis process just to make sure that your uh, you can you can get rid of as much as of the gDNA. Um, what Kaijin has o offers is different types depending on on the needs of the experiment. So either you can you can have the DNA's digestion after the isolation process, or what you can do is you can do it during with help of the eliminator columns, which comes with our easy plus kits, or you can use the eliminator solution, which comes with plus universal kits. And I think I'll go a little bit more details about that in the coming slides. Uh, as I mentioned, that how it can really interfere with your, uh, with the spikes and, and, and having wrong data at the end. You can see that when you use the Kaijin and you had the amplification plot, and when you use the supplier, some other supplier, you had this uh, additional uh, amplification during the cycling. Okay, so I, I think uh, this is a particular, in particular, a little bit crowded um, uh, slide. I, I didn't know how I could, I could put that, but this was just this, the whole take-home message is to show you that for every sample type and every need, there is a specific kit available from Kaijin because of our um, uh, of our quality, which which we provide with with our kits, and then you can also choose the capacity that you would like you'd want to specifically have for your for for your for your for your particular needs or particular sample types. Uh, 
Kaijin has these new, um, I think more, many people are aware about the RNA Easy kits, but we have these RNA Easy Plus kits, which have the same procedure of bind washing elute, but you can, as I mentioned before, you can do the genomic DNA during that process. So the RNA Easy Plus kits are having an eliminator spin column, which is so second, like after once um, during you have done the lysis and homogenization, you do the on-column genomic DNA digestion before moving for further and getting your total RNA. With the RNA Easy Plus universal kits, you also do the, you use, you, at the second step, you use the genomic DNA eliminator solution to get, to make sure that you are free of the gDNA. Uh, a little bit about the micro RNA Easy. Uh, it's very quickly growing field uh, in the research, and uh, they're normally the microRNAs are a class of en endogenous, naturally occurring uh, uh, 18 to 24 nucleotide non-coding RNAs uh, that they mediate the the post-transcriptional gene regulation. Due to their short length, they usually require specialized isolation and analysis protocol. So Kaigen has this Kaigen micro RNA range of kits which uses Kaiazole as part of it. Um, so when using phenol-based purification with tri-region, uh, you eliminate any phenol carryover by using the spin column technology instead of uh, using the phase separation method. So basically the, the, the message is that you do not have any phenol carryover and a highly pure RNA uh, if you use um, this technique. And here it is shown also when the OD values were taken that uh, phenol which absorbs at 270, you can see if the micro RNA easy which is in blue line was used and if the triazole was used. Exosome uh, isolation, uh, it's, it's becoming a, um, again a, a, an interesting field where people in liquid biopsies, um, they want to isolate exosomes, they want to categorize them. At the same time, people also want to go further and they want to look at the, um, the RNAs which are present inside the exosome. So with, uh, with one of our uh, partners, Exosome Diagnostics, Kaijin has, uh, uh, has gone for two type of kits. One is exoRNA Easy, which you can specifically use to get micro RNAs. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the RNA isolate, exosomal RNA isolation, and then you have ExoEasy just if you want to do the characterization and just want to have the exosomes. Uh, there are, we have a series of special exosome webinars available for this topic because it's a new upcoming technology, how it is compared with the, let's say the gold standard ultra centrifugation, so I think that should be interesting for only for people who really want to, um, are doing in, uh, something in that direction. Now the last part of, uh, of today's webinar, I wanted to show you some of the tools from Kaijin. For example, I like really this one, this is a, uh, we call it the RNA selection wheel. This is available online on, if you go on the kaijin.com. What it helps you is that um, all the different solutions that I show, shared with you during the presentation, you can actually go, you can click on on your sample type and then you can choose the right quantity. You can choose whether you're looking for RNA, whether you're looking for RNA including micro RNA, whether you're looking for genomic DNA removal, exosomal, re, re, exosomal RNA, and then it shows you the right product and you just have to click on that and it takes you directly to the product page. Also, we have uh, developed with time, and we we call it the RNA Resource Center. Um, we we before had like all the information was like in bits and pieces, but in last five years since I've also been here, we have put all that together into a resource center. So you, if you go there, you can get the RNA web app that I showed you right in the beginning. There are videos. There also these videos are also available on YouTube if you would like to search. We call them the troubleshooting guide, like five common problems in our RNA isolation and the easy solution for that, the RNA easy. You can download some of the white papers. You can go further. 
if you are interested in the exosomes and uh, you can you can also know more about the microRNA and then you can we have these uh, all these tips and tricks available as posters so you can download these posters depending on your sample type well yeah thank you for your attention and with that I'm uh, almost at the end of my presentation I hope it was helpful and I'm, I'm I'm open for any questions as well. Thank you so much, Abhishek, for that informative presentation. We'll now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of your presentation window, type that question into the box that appears on the screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. We have a great audience today, and we'll start with question number one. What can I use to isolate RNA smaller than 200 nucleotides? Okay, uh, so I think as I mentioned that uh, normally anything which is below 200 nucleotides, we consider that as the microRNA specifically, so I think that's what uh, the person uh, would be talking about. So. From Kaizen, we have developed this series of uh, micro rna mini kits and the micro rna 96 kit, depending on your, uh, your, your isolation, either from cells or tissues. Uh, we also have, uh, if you're working with clinical samples, we all, uh, especially with human blood, we also have the Pax gene blood micro RNA and tissue uh, micro RNA kits, which can be used for. Uh, blood which is stored with the vaccine blood RNA tube or the tissue containers respectively uh, and uh, because uh, there are many protocols have been developed for micro RNA so you can also isolate using a supplementary protocol which can be found out on Kaijin's literature page and I would really recommend to have a look at that because there are many user developed protocols there yeah thank you great thank you so much Abhishek our next question is, do you have a kit for RNA isolation from any kind of sample type? Uh, well, that's an interesting question because uh, I think during the presentation, as I shared with you, that every sample type and every, every tissue, or uh, we can categorize them a little bit, like we, we can call them easy to lyse tissues or cell lysates or difficult to lyse tissues, but then you have special needs for different type of uh, sample types, and that's why there is a range of kits that have been developed with uh, standardized protocols behind that. So, yeah, I mean, there's no one-for-all solution, but I think if you want, you just want to do some, you have some easy um, to lyse tissues or cells, then I would say RNA easy plus mini. Um, if you have more difficult to lyse tissues, like uh, uh, rat tail or, or hurt or uh, something like that or fatty tissues, then I would say RNA Z plus universal mini should be the solution for you. Uh, but at the same time, as I said, then you have dedicated kits for plant or viral or bacteria. So you should always check out these, uh, these selection guides available depending on sample type. Yeah. Thank you. We have a wonderful audience today and time for a couple of more questions. Here's one. Is it possible to isolate RNA from saliva? Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, you can, and I think it's important, especially for, and, and this is becoming bigger and bigger, like especially people who are working in infectious uh, uh, diseases or for, for micro, microbiome portfolios. So, uh, and Kaijin recently um, uh, has acquired a, uh, a company called Mobio, which is which is based in California, in uh, and they have uh, they've specialized with the with working with microbiome. So if you go on kaijin.com, you'll find specialized solutions for working with saliva or soil or urine or different type of uh, clinical samples. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Our audience member would like to know, how do I make sure the gDNA is completely removed from RNA? I think that's a, that's a good question. Uh, so as I, as I mentioned that 
it's an it's important we all understand that genomic DNA removal. So it would be important that you use a protocol which which removes the genomic DNA during the RNA isolation process itself, uh, and that would be either using an eliminator solution or on-column digestion. At the same time, you can always, if you are doing very sensitive application and you think there might be a chance, you can always use a additional RNAs, uh, free DNA set, and then you can use the DNA set to further, and that should normally give you um, complete removal of genomic DNA. And, and some people still do during the cDNA synthesis, they use the, the DNAs, uh, which is also fine, which is, which is no problem. That doesn't hinder anything. It's just an additional step. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can do that also. Yeah. Abhishek, thank you so much for your informative presentation and your important research. Do you have any closing remarks you'd like to share with the audience before we close today? No, I'm, I'm, I think it was very, very nice session, and I'm always open for any more questions. When people um, listen to it afterwards, they can always reach out to us. And um, I think everyone knows that Kaizen is a global leader in the um, and have been the pioneers of sample technologies, and we keep on improving our techniques. So, uh, yes, um, yeah, feel free to reach out to our technical team or any one of us if you have any questions related to your experiment designing, uh, I would say not designing, but it, during your uh, uh, protocol selection or if you, if you have any technical questions or, or related to RNA yields or queries. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you again, Abhishek, for your presentation. I'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Kyogen, for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 2017. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.